Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, the organizers, for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be in a, an event like this, a very good event, exciting topics. And uh, I'll talk about the, the work we've been doing. And it's an ongoing investigation on the extended Hubbard model on a, with the bipolar interactions on a square optical lattice. So the, oh, oh, sorry, let me acknowledge my collaborators. This is Thiago Mendes Santos, a former student who's now at Trieste, and Ruben Mondaini, who holds a position in the Beijing Computational Science Research Center, and Teresa Paiva, who's a professor at the UFR Rota, and myself. So uh, the outline, we're going to talk a lot about cold atoms in optical lattices, and then we'll go into uh, mention about dipolar atoms, and then talk about the dipolar extended Hubbard model, briefly introduce the uh, diagonalization technique we use, and then results and conclusions. So you all know that uh, strong correlations makes it very hard to model and to make accurate predictions, especially in low dimensions due to strong fluctuations. And the things get worse if you introduce multi-bands, more than one band, hybridization, and so on. So what one does is one resorts to simplified models, approximations, and uh, further simplifications. So, but the, the picture changed a bit, or quite a lot actually, in 1995 with the possibility of having ultra-cold atoms. And uh, with those you can reach ultra-low temperatures in the scale of nanokelvin. You can talk about ultra low density condensed matter physics because you have a density of 10 to the 13 or 10 to the 14th which is 10 to the minus 6 the density of air so you can see that they are almost isolated so that's prone to manipulation and detection techniques so I'll show you some novel techniques that have been developed and have been helping the, the discussion in this area so uh, you can, for instance, you can prepare your system in chosen hyperfine states. And uh, so the atoms interact at very low energy, so you can stop at S-wave scattering. And the Feshbach resonance controls the, the scattering and the interaction, as we'll see. So, uh, so you can use this as a, a new paradigm in, in condensed matter physics. So for instance, what you have, you have counter-propagating laser beams. And uh, we use also, with this, you can generate a periodic potential in which the lattice properties are related to the uh, laser, your laser field, for instance, the uh, the lattice constant is half of the laser wavelength, and the depth is uh, given by roughly the, the ratio between the laser intensity and the detuning between the atomic uh, frequency and the, the frequency of the laser. So that you add a harmonic trap so that you can confine your, your, your atoms in there and what you get is an optical lattice. So essentially what you have, you have the tunneling rate between the two minima, and you have an on-site interaction, and you can also have a site energy, you can incorporate the, the, the trap in this site energy, and this is what we have, optical lattice. So it's a very interesting uh, setup, for instance, it started with the bosons in the, the study of uh, Bose-Einstein condensation. And with these atoms here, which are bosonic atoms. And, but later on, people started to, uh, to have a trap of fermionic atoms. 
And you see that the difference here, for instance, if you take lithium and uh, lithium-6 and li lithium-7, we have one more neutron than in lithium-6. So this makes it a fermion, and this is a, a boson atom. So with this degenerate Fermi gas of atoms, you can have the, say, form a, an equal mixture of these two hyperfine states, which is our spin up and spin down. And when you talk about dipolar atoms, it's always good to uh, stress that what we're calling here spin up and spin down is not an actual spin state, but the two different species. And so we're the simplest model we can think of on an optical lattice is the Hubbard model. Of course, uh, this transparency is for general purposes. I know all of you know this, that uh, the Hubbard model is, plays the role of the Ising model for strongly correlated systems. And uh, so the, the, the Hubbard model, you have the hopping amplitude, which is the, the rate of, of tunneling rate. And so this lowers the energy if you uh, let your, your, or your fermions uh, travel through the lattice. And you have a non-site interaction, which you can take repulsive or attractive. And in this case, we'll consider uh, repulsive. And so you play, you, you pay a price if two fermions occupy the same well. So the whole idea is that you can control, I'll talk a bit more about this now, you can control this strength of the interaction through the um, applied magnetic field. So the way it goes, very briefly and very sketchy, is that if you're, if you're working with the S-wave scattering only, you can have this uh, scattering length controls the, the partial wave scattering and the cross-session. And what you do is that you have a, a, a state that is a state of the a scattering state of two isolated particles, the two isolated atoms, and you can control, you can imagine that you can also have a, you could also have a bound state, and this bound state is separated in energy by a kind of a Zeeman term which you can control. So you can make this scattering state resonate with the bound state. And that controls the strength of the interaction, depending on the, on the difference in energy. So with this, you can fine tune the interaction through the scattering length. B0 is the resonance field, and delta is the, the difference in magnetic field from uh, from this uh, uh, resonance. And what you do is that you can, with this, you can study the repulsive and the attractive model as well. So you have a laboratory in which you can study these uh, systems. So the energy scales for comparison between optical lattices and crystal lattices, you well it's well known that the, the hopping amplitude is, uh, is the the, the overlap between the, the orbitals and the, the Coulomb interaction is the site interaction between the two fermions. And so the scale of energy we're talking about here is in, in milli electron volts. So what we usually do is that we always refer to the energy and temperature units in terms of the hopping amplitude. Whereas in optical lattice, the main parameter is the recoil energy, they call. Lambda is the, is the, the laser frequency. And you get, f for instance, for lithium atoms, you get a recoil energy in the order of nanokelvin or microkelvin. So you need new measurements and protocols of temperature to work in this, in this low temperature. And for very interesting proposals, our collaborator Teresa Paiva was involved in this in these papers, which set up the protocols. We'll go back to them later on. So the energy and temperature units now are given in terms of the recoil energy. So there's a 
one-to-one -one correspondence between the Hubbard model on a lattice and the Hubbard model on, uh, on the optical lattice and the crystal lattice. So these are the parameters. You don't, uh, don't expect you to, to look at this. And so basically what we have here in the experiments, it turns out that we're dealing with a micrometer uh, wavelength so that the hopping integral is about 10 nanokelvin. And we always deal with the strong coupling. This is the, the interesting point. So we are aiming at looking at the strong coupling Hubbard model. So the exchange energy with this, in the usual way, gives you 4 nanokelvin. So it's a very small energy scale. So let's see what they, the experimentalists came up with. So the first uh, observation of a mod insulator state in fermionic atoms came out in about uh, 2008, about 10 years ago. And you see here, for instance, that if you have, uh, this is a double occupancy as a function of the uh, number of atoms in your trap. And you see that if you switch off the, the interaction, you can, you have a, a, a double occupancy. As long as you switch the trap on, you switch on the, the, the interaction, you get a, a, a decrease in the double occupancy. So, uh, but later on, in 2009, a breakthrough, as far as experiments are concerned, is the s people started to do imaging. So you take a, a view of your cloud, of your atomic cloud, and with that you can see where the atoms are and see how they cluster, how they occupy a the question of being singly occupied sites or doubly occupied sites. And so uh, some very interesting imaging uh, effects you can get. And it's interesting that you can see if you shine light, you can get rid of pairs. If this is the real space occupation. You shine light, and then you ev sort of evaporate the double, uh, uh, the you evaporate pairs so you don't have double occupancy. So the your sites are either empty or, or singly occupied. And with this, you can have some very interesting imaging. And here you increase, again, the atom number in, in, your, in your atomic cloud. And you can have something like uh, what we call a mod core or a mod ring, because this was the first. The, the, the holy grail here is that people want to uh, study antiferromagnetism. They want to see antiferromagnetism, but the, the so far the temperature scale is still higher than what you need to see a very uh, uh, definite uh, evidence for uh, long-range order. So you can see evidence for antiferromagnetism, but you don't, you cannot make be sure that you have long-range order. So this is interesting because we uh, we also did some side common, nothing to do with the the main the main topic. So with Tiago as well, we studied uh, the the effect of a parabolic trap onto the physical properties, and we managed to identify the presence of a mod core and a mod ring by looking at the density as a function of the radius, uh, as a function of the distance. And we sort of came up with a phase diagram between that you have uh, uh, here is essentially, a s this is a scaling parameter. I don't want to go into the details, but this is essentially the, the opening of the trap. So as you close the trap, you go this way, so you force the appearance of a ring from a mod core. And if you keep the the trap, o uh, the same opening, and increase the the intense the, the the interaction. You go from a mod ring to a mod core. So this is uh, the power of imaging that you can get with these experiments. So this is a uh, also uh, people started looking at uh, various groups throughout the world competing with each other, and uh, so for several different uh, 
uh, atomic species and the lithium and, and potassium. So there are <laughs> several groups and Teresa uh, collaborated with this group and this group, they gave them support. So well she was part of the theoretical team. And so with this, uh, you see that they can have perfect images of MOT behavior in, in these uh, systems. And in particular, and now I should call your attention uh, to the title. This is an experimental paper, though with the support of theoretical support of Therese is here. And, uh, but you see, that you see if, you, if you saw this title, you'd think it's a theoretical paper, right? Because there's no, uh, there's no mention to uh, uh, an experiment here. So this is exactly in, in tune with what people say, that they use these atomic experiments to uh, replace or complement the theoretical uh, studies on this. So what do you get here? I want to uh, guide you through this. Uh, so this is the local moment. W yeah. Repulsive, repulsive. From now on, it's all, all, always repulsive. Uh, so this is the local moment, which I'll define more precisely in, in a minute. That's the local moment as a function. This is the actual image as a function of the radius from the center. And what you get here is that you see that there's a maximum around this ring here and then it decays to zero. So this image is, uh, is very powerful in the sense that you can tell you a lot about what's going on. So for instance, this is a, the moment-moment correlation function, which is essentially, uh, I'll show you in a minute, which is essentially the measures charge correlations. So, and then you see here that, again, if you place charge in the middle, the charge won't be uh, immediately around it, but it will be around uh, seven atomic distances here. And the same thing here, is this is the spin correlation function. So it tells you that if you put a spin here, and then you have around this position here, you have spin down. If you put spin up, then you get a spin down. So this is evidence, experimental evidence, for antiferromagnetic correlations. So these are the quantities. So uh, the spin degree of freedom, so this is the magnetization, and this cor spin correlation function uh, measures the, the correlation function uh, measured over the nearest neighbors. And the local moment, you measure charge. Again, I, I, I stress that charge should be in inverted commas but it's the, the use is so widespread that uh, I feel funny if I put some inverted commas because we, the atoms are neutral. Yeah. About, sorry? Um, no, this is probably the temperature and the parameters. There's, not, there's, not, uh, there's nothing special at this. So this is the local moment. So it, this measures, essentially, it's related to the double occupancy. And this is the correlation function they measure. This is not the one we calculate. Or I'll go back to this. So it's a correlation function between this variable here. So this gives you, again, uh, is a measure of charge correlation functions. So going back to that, you see that you can relate this to a, uh, a occupation here larger than half filling, and you get um, most of the occupation uh, before this. And so you can play with the experiments. You can s propose uh, whatever you, you can calculate. The at this stage, the experimentalist can, can check for you. So uh, a later development was the study of uh, spin imbalance in a 2D Fermi Herbert, again, uh, again uh, repulsive uh, 
Hubble model. So you have more spins up than spins down, meaning more one species than another. So things are, are happening in this area. So this is a new paradigm. And so the control parameters in optical lattice experiments allow you to uh, have uh, what they call quantum simulators. And so these experiments, as you saw by the title of these papers, the experiments are devised to solve models that uh, other uh, methods, the theoretical methods, fail. And so these are the new frontiers of many body physics. Can you use this, this control to, to build a setup for quantum computation? And so uh, what I want to convince you is that we go beyond quantum simulators. I think this is a chance to have a control of new phases that have not been present before. So f one of the directions is, or the one we're we're discussing here is creating a, a gas or, or, or of polar molecules. Now the molecules can be either uh, they can either have uh, electric or di uh, magnetic dipole moments. So that uh, the whole idea is that you can probe the effect of the dipolar interactions. So there are two, essentially two methods to do this. They're very tricky. The, you can either start from pre-cooled atoms and then make molecules out of these pre-cooled atoms, or you have a direct process in which you cool the pre-existing molecules as long as they, are, they have dipoles. So this is already has been done. Of course, as usual, they start with the Bose uh, mixtures, with Bose atoms, or Bose molecules, and this is very interesting. This gives you a, a flavor of what's going on. So this is the, the atom, the molecules, atoms on the lattice, and with the, you can control, you suppose these are uh, magnetic dipoles, with the, now you can use a field to control the orientation of these dipoles. So you assume all of them point towards the same direction, and with the field, you can put them either on the plane or perpendicular to this plane, and you can have interactions. The interactions, of course, are dependent on, on the angles, and they can measure this. So this, this uh, polar angle, for instance, the theta angle is like in spherical coordinates, you can vary this angle, and you can go, for instance, for the, this interaction delta J here, which is a second neighbor. You can go from positive to negative, depending on the angle. And uh, so uh, finally, you had uh, people managed to do this with the Fermi gas and in 2010, to 2012. And uh, for instance, they started with erbium has a very large magnetic moment of 10 uh, Bohr magnetons. And uh, so that this is the general form for the dipolar interaction, which of course you all know. And But the interesting aspect here is that you have the, the, the radii, the direction of the dipoles, and here you have this constant that can be either a magnetic constant or can be an electric constant. They haven't done that yet. Or this, this is uh, so so far as it's so hard that uh, I don't know if they they'll be able to do that, but probably they would. Uh, so far, as far as I know, there's only one realization of bipolar Fermi atoms in a, on an optical lattice. And uh, so the question I would like to answer here is that. Is it worth the effort to pursue these experiments? Because it's, it's, it's very hard. And so what interesting features do we expect? So the, what we can do is that we examine the dipolar extended Fermi Herbert model. And uh, here I again recall that now that we're introducing, for instance, magnetic dipoles, 
I recall that the spin degrees of freedom, what we call the spin degrees of freedom in condensed matter, are the hyperfine states. So the spin up and spin down that we have is uh, just a, a nom nomenclature for hyperfine states. And the, the charge degrees of freedom is simply a spatial distribution of polar atoms. So let me recall you uh, what's the extended, the usual extended Hubbard model. So I, I showed you the Hubbard model with the, the usual Hubbard model, which is the, the one that you have only on-site interaction. It can be this on-site interaction can be uh, either attractive or repulsive. And if you consider this quadrant, quadrant here, you have uh, just the repulsion and the rep nearest neighbor repulsion. So charge doesn't like, is repelled even if they stay in, in nearest neighbor sites. So uh, the ground state here in this half of the diagram is uh, what we call antiferromagnet. This is half filling, so it's a, this is a, a mod state that you have the spin up is red and spin down is, again, spin up mean in the force of, in this sense here. Uh, so you have a, a, a mod state here. So if you increase the charge density wave, uh, if you increase the, the Coulomb repulsion, nearest neighbor repulsion, then you get a checkerboard uh, charge distribution. And uh, so there, is, there are more subtle things in this model. This model itself I is, is very interesting. So if you, uh, I would concentrate just on this uh, part of the diagram, but let me just show you uh, what's up ahead that we can consider. So this model in one dimension is well known, even though there is a appearance of a called bond ordered wave, which is uh, almost like an RVB, but it's, it's not really. And separating the it's weak coupling separated in spin density wave and the charge density wave states. And it can survive, the charge density wave survives even if you go into the uh, attractive on site. But if you have both interactions uh, attractive, you can get superconductivity in a region, this region here. This, uh, you still have a spin density wave here, but these two are singlet superconducting and triplet superconducting states. And here you have phase separation in, in which you have a, a segregation between doubly occupied and empty sites. So uh, you can imagine that if you can uh, probe this with atomic uh, cold atoms, it would be very interesting. But so far, we're concentrating here. So this is the one-dimensional extended Hubbard model at half filling, and this is the extended Hubbard model at quarter filling. And here's even more interesting. You have a, a metal insulator transition in, in at quarter filling. So it doesn't mean that, like here, uh, you have a, this quadrant here is all uh, uh, insulating, and this one here, you have uh, a metal insulator transition. So lots of interesting things could happen if you consider this model. But so far, we are concentrating on this part of the diagram. So what is the dipolar extended Hubbard model? Have the usual uh, hopping term, the usual uh, repulsive, on-site repulsion, and now we consider a longer range interaction, which is the dipolar interaction. So now we have the, what we call the spin-up species. It's uh, red, and the spin-down species is green. And we assume all dipoles point along the same direction. And these angles, as I said, are experimentally controlled by the external field. And uh, so what we do is that we use Lancho's diagonalization. So I don't know if all of you are familiar with it. It's a very simple method to diagonalize uh, quantum Hamiltonians. And you start from a state that you hope has some overlap with your ground state. And then you 
apply the Hamiltonian, and then you project along the direction of what you started from, and so you get this, and you project along a perpendicular direction. And then you generate another state. You now apply h to this state, and you end up, say, here, and again you project in the previous directions, and what's left out you call psi2, and then you act on psi2, and so on and so forth, and you end up with a tridiagonal uh, matrix. And this saves memory. The symmetries are incorporated automatically. If you choose your, your basis sets, you, in this case, you have translations, rotations, and time reversal. And the interesting thing is get for each symmetry sector, you get a fast convergence of your results for the ground state energy. So what we consider here, which I some of you might think it's a very small lattice, a 4x4 four four lattice, but that's as far as we can go with this method. And uh, so the we take the interaction form, and because of the smallness of the lattice, we introduce a cutoff in the dipolar interaction, go up to second neighbor sites only, but still preserves the effects of longer range and the anisotropy. This is what we want to investigate. So these are the interaction terms. And so, for instance, Vx, taken from here, the interaction along this direction is given by that. Vy, Vz, Vd1, is along the one of the diagonals, and Vd2 along the, the other diagonal. So these are the interactions due to this cutoff. And it's interesting to see that these interactions can are uh, directionally repulsive or attractive, which brings about a very interesting competition. So from now on, we'll concentrate on half-field band, one fermion per site. And uh, a special case, of course, is the, the usual uh, extended Hubbard model. So let's look at the isotropic dipolar case. Now we put the magnetic field and we align the dipoles perpendicular to this plane, right? So it's a two-dimensional two dimensional plane, and we place the magnetic field like this, so we align the, the dipoles in this way. So these angles are all zero, and so the, this distance can be either one or root two, and again, we, keep, we fix the repulsion, repulsion on the strong coupling value. And so for the isotropic dipolar case, what do we get? So we calculate the spin correlation function and the simpler charge correlation function. And we measure this in different distances. So we have the, f the nearest neighbors, which in the isotropic case shouldn't matter, but this is what we're going to exactly show. And you have the second neighbor, the correlations between second neighbors and correlation between third neighbors along one of the directions. Okay, so in this case, for the isotropic dipole, isotropic in the sense that the magnetic field is pointing perpendicular to the plane, all the Vs are positive. So let's look at this is the spin correlation function that we get. Let me guide you to what we the results we obtain. So uh, this is the correl spin correlation function. If you look at the, say, the correlations, spin correlations along the x direction, what you get is that, as a function of the dipolar strength, we call this is the strength of the dipolar interaction. Right? What do we get? The, the first neighbor, the, correlation, the spin correlations are negative. So it means that if you start from a up spin, the next spin is a down spin. And so it's negative. And it's the same as the first neighbor along the x, y direction, which is underneath this red curve here. So they are very, they are equal. But if you look at these directions, then you have positive correlations. So this means that this guy, if this guy is up, this guy will tend to be up as well. Okay? 
And same thing here. If this is up, this guy is up. So we have up, down, down, up, up. So this is what you get. You get your old MOT state or anti-ferromagnetic state. Now let's look at the charge correlations. Of course, because uh, the, the occupancy here is homogeneous, the correlation function sits at 1 and stays there. But as soon as you reach this critical value of the bipolar strength and you eliminate your spin correlation functions, the same thing, uh, the, the complement happens here with the charge correlation. You start to develop charge correlations. Again, here for this value of u, what you get is that you had this homogeneous, and then all of a sudden you start developing a strong... Uh, uh, you, let's look at the red first. The red and, and the black curve here, they mean that if they go down, it means a depletion of the sites, of the first neighbor sites. And if you look at the green and the, and the blue curve here, then you get an enhancement of the charge. So this means that this state is this one. It's a checkerboard state. So this is a transition between an anti-ferromagnetic or MOT state and a, ch a checkerboard charge density wave. So now we tilt the magnetic field towards this x direction. So these are the angles. And now we see some different things. The same thing happens is similar to what we had before, but with some subtle differences. Here, the correlations are not isotropic. And this is so because uh, this means that the correlations along the x and y directions are not the same. So this is due, you can understand this, as a result of, if you look, go into strong coupling, the effective uh, interaction between the spin degrees of freedom is given by this expression. So if V is not the same along the two directions, this reflects itself in the correlation function. So a similar analysis, if you do the charge correlations, you see that what you get here is uh, horizontal stripes, right? You have horizontal stripes here. The you look at the red ones, for instance. If you look at the red along this direction, it means that you want to have your next neighbor occupied. But if you look at the, the black curve here, you don't the black curve is underneath here. You it's depleted. The first the row is depleted. Whereas if you if you go to the, the green one is also depleted. So you don't want anybody here or anybody there. Okay? So this is a horizontal stripe. And uh, so you can change now theta and ask yourself, now you fix V to a given value, and you change the, the angle. So this is very convenient for the experimentalist because you, what you, all you do is to tilt your magnetic field. And when you do this, you see that you start from a uh, checkerboard uh, uh, pattern for the spins and uh, the charge. You have charge correlations, but you have no spin correlations. And then as you change theta, you go through uh, an antiferromagnet, though with an isotropic correlations. And then you end up with charge density wave or horizontally striped. So you can set up with this, you can set up a phase diagram as uh, for the potential for the uh, V, which is the uh, strength of the dipole interaction as a function of, of the angle theta. And what we saw that we were about V equals 3.6. So we would go from a checkerboard charge density wave with an intermediate antiferromagnetic phase and then a horizontal checkerboard a horizontal charge density wave. So what are these two curves here? So if, if V is small enough, you'll never get this phase. And then you can go this way. So what are these two curves? The, the points are actual data that we obtain. 
through, through Lange's diagonalizations. And uh, so this is a, a blow up of this area here. And the, the full curve here is uh, an atomic limit, which is you, you set your hopping equal to zero. So this is the strong coupling, very strong coupling. So you see that the very strong coupling gives you a, a reasonable, uh, at least qualitative description of this. So we can use this to go through the phase diagram quicker. So what we have here, recall that this is on one side and this is another side. And what we have here, we have different inter uh, emerging phases here. So this is the horizontal. This is theta, which is the polar angle, and phi, the azimuthal angle. So you can, by tuning, by changing the, the field, you can go from this phase, which is the horizontal uh, stripes, and you can, this phase here is uh, a checkerboard. You go from this one to a checkerboard, and then you tilt the whole thing of pi over 2. And then these stripes are, are vertical now, and as you carry on. If you, on this side, you can get uh, a diagonal, a diagonal uh, stripe, and two diagonal stripes. So this means you have many different states by varying very simple parameters, which can be controlled. And so th this makes it uh, very promising. So I think it's with this multitude of phases, you see that it's definitely worth the effort to, to have these dipolar atoms in optical lattices. You have control of many different atomic arrangements by varying simple parameters. So you can explore quantum criticality and have a possibility of having uh, different regimes like superfluidity and perhaps even quantum computation. Okay, so, and I thank you for your attention. <coughs> Yeah, well, the problem with DM DMRG is that we are restricted to one dimension.